morning, good morning, good morning. Glad to have everybody. Um, I'm going to do a tiny, tiny bit longer intro for our morning person who talks. Uh, in the news, we've heard a lot of things about toxic men in Hollywood. And I've worked for some of them. <laughs> Those were other stories for another day. Um, I want to tell you the story about why Jeff is such a cool guy. I would say that he is like the mentor to almost anyone that I've known in the town. I did two weeks as a temp at Northern Exposure. And you don't expect anything out of that. But of course, your brain is going, I wonder if anyone will read my script. That's my goal, right? Um, and I always tell my students here with my trick, it was an accident. I always read an actual book when I'm someplace instead of my, well, there weren't poems then, but I read a book. And he happened to come in one morning reading the same book. So we ended up in a conversation about the book. And then he told me about a script he was writing. And he asked me if I would copy edit it for him. Right? I was like, I got nothing better to do, and of course I will. And for whatever reason, the little voice in my brain went, if you'll read a script for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, who the hell am I to ask that? <laughs> and he could have said, I'm too funny. <laughs> but he said, sure. Right? So of course I read his, and it was brilliant, because it was. Um, and then I, I was two weeks, and I was done. And I thought, well, he's never going to call me. He's never going to see me again. Like, he just did a nice thing to make it sound good, right? And about a month later, I did a phone call. This is really good. We should have breakfast. I was like, oh my god, he never knew where I was, right? And um, the problem was he was in the middle management of the show at the time, and there were some folks there who knew me as a secretary from a previous show, and they had a policy never to take scripts from secretaries. Uh -huh. So I couldn't get a script in no English I was like, damn. Um, but about three years later, and he could totally have forgotten who I was and not paid any attention to me, he became the executive producer of Pick Offenses. And he called and he said, now I'm the guy who picks scripts. You want to pitch? And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> this does not happen every day in this town, right? So that's the person that I invited to speak today um, that I'm very excited to have with us. And of course, the top of the show running is a fascinating thing. So, Jeff, you're out. Um. Thanks, Roseanne. And of course, I think when Hollywood lost potentially a staff writer or executive producer, Academia gained a terrific, a terrific teacher and administrator. It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure to guest teach at Stevens Low Residency Program on the Henson campus uh, several times, uh, which is what led to, to this invitation. And uh, when I was told the the theme of the uh, of the weekend or the week, um, very much like a politician. Um, no matter what question you're asked, you come with the answer that you're, deliver you're prepared to deliver. So uh, this is going to be about show running. Uh, there is a bit that I've tried to uh, adjust for or emphasize for purposes of why we're here. Um, but I began uh, teaching uh, for any number of different reasons, but I began this program for the Writers Guild uh, 20 years ago called the Showrunner Training Program because the, the system that I was brought up under, the old broadcast system in which there was a de facto apprenticeship in which you learned the ropes uh, before you were allowed to even pitch a show, um, it had its drawbacks. Uh, as I say in my book, uh, that uh, before you could sound like nobody else, you had to prove you could sound like everybody else. And the fact is they didn't want you to sound like nobody else. They wanted you to sound like everybody else. So the, the thing that I was amazed at when I started in the business wasn't that there was so much crap on television. It was amazing there was anything good on television. And there were a lot of good shows, and there always have been. Uh, it just took a lot of, of effort. But that system that taught you um, how to write, shoot, and post a show, how to edit a show, was going away for some good reasons, which is because there's a proliferation of new opportunities, and uh, people were finally looking on the executive suite for fresh, original voices. That's all good. The problem was TV is a business. It's show business. The show is very important, but so is the business. And so a lot of shows were failing not for lack of talent, but because the people who were put in charge didn't know how to keep the show on the air. So the ethos for the show and our training program was there are a lot of reasons that shows fail, but ignorance shouldn't be one of them. You should succeed or fail on the merits of your own ideas. And so we created this master class. A number of people were involved in helping create it. John Wells was the president of the, the guild at the time. And uh, Carol Kirshner, I met, who's run a number of programs in town. And she became the professional director. Yvette Lee Bowser, 
who was the first African-American woman to create a TV series, Living Single, became my half-hour counterpart in the program. And the idea was a master class, 25 to 30 people, application only. We interviewed them. And uh, the first year, we didn't know how many people would apply, so we made the, the bar fairly low in terms of who could apply, and we got way over 200 applications. And each, well, twice now, we've raised the bar uh, so that you have to be a writer-producer at a certain level or have active development, and we still get uh, about 180, 190 applicants a year for 25 to 30 slots. And we have an admissions committee, and we interview about 60 people to get it down to 25 or 30. Um, for reasons I'm not going to, we're talking about expanding it because the need has become even greater in the last 20 years than it was when we began. Uh, but uh, that experience helped drive the book, and, uh, and I still enjoy the teaching. And anyway, so today um, I'm going to be conducting this a little bit like a class in the sense that I hope it's a bit interactive. I hope if I, uh, and I have a tendency to, to uh, race through things, uh, as I was telling uh, Megan Lorian yesterday, I, I have a tendency to put 12 pounds in a 10-pound bag. So if, if there's anything that you don't understand, um, if you have a question about something, um, just sing out, raise your hand, throw something up on stage, do something like that. Uh, because I really do want you to proceed with, with understanding. And then I'll be Judge Judy about it if I decide that uh, we'll talk about it later, we'll talk about it later. But if it's something that's important to talk about, we'll get it done. All right, with that in mind, um, as I put up on the board, this is really a, somewhat a history lesson about show running. It talks about where it came from, what's happened to it, and where are we at. And I was thinking as I was listening to the presentations of, the last, of yesterday that it actually could almost be conceived of as a drama in three acts. And this may seem a little familiar. <laughs> First is the belief system is introduced and reinforced, okay? Then what happens is the belief system is tested and fails. And then finally, a new belief system is forged, allowing our hero to fight on. So that really is kind of the story of show running up to this point. Now more specifically, our agenda will be, not necessarily in this order, but hopefully by the time we're through, answer what is a showrunner? How did the position originate? Why has showrunning not caught on outside the United States? How has streaming affected showrunning? How have women affected showrunning? How is the current WGA strike likely to affect showrunning? And what does all this mean for the future of television? I'm going to try to answer all those, and if I don't, I hope you've forgotten some of these by the time we're through. But... <laughs> okay, so first, let's talk about where it came from. Um, to the uninitiated, you'd think that television's roots must be movies. But it's not the movies. What is it? Obviously, yes. Or not so obviously. But it is radio. Every genre that we see on TV today was developed by the pioneers of radio. So you've got mysteries, you've got science fiction, you've got comedy, you've got even Ted Max Amateur Hour, which is the predecessor of American Idol and The Voice and everything else we see. Um, so nothing new under the sun, it's just how is it being done today. But it's not just radio in terms of it being a technology, it's how radio developed in the United States, which has its own unique history that's different from the rest of the world. And so we start, and, and where's Armando? Guglielmo Marconi, is that correct? Yeah. Correcto? Okay, all right. I just call him Bill, okay? Um, okay, so he was a, a brilliant guy, one of several at the time who was experimenting with the wireless telegraph. Remember up to that point, telegraph was a marvelous invention. There was even cables being laid across the ocean, but you either had to have a direct, you had to have a direct connection like that. You couldn't, you couldn't communicate uh, unless you had a physical connection to the transmitter and the receiver. So he developed this thing, and uh, he took it to the Italian authorities in 1895, and for whatever reason, they didn't want anything to do with it. So he had an Irish mother who maybe would have been homesick, so let's go to London. So they go to London, 
And the custom office opens up this case that has all this gadgetry in it. And a couple years before, an Italian anarchist had killed the French president. So they were very suspicious of this, and they destroyed it. <laughs> but he rebuilt it, and he managed to get uh, people interested in England, including the government, because like any new technology, one of the first uses is the military. And in terms of naval communication, the ability to, to, to be able to communicate ship to ship and ship to shore was hugely important. And the next application was commercial. Commercial fleets that need to know about storms, need to know what's going on. So the British government got behind it, and then they formed the Marconi Corporation, the wireless telegraph company. And then he formed an American version in 1899, the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of America which 20 years later would become RCA, the biggest and most important uh, company involved in the beginning of broadcasting in the United States. But we have to back up a little bit and say, so how, what happened between 1899 and 1919? Well, for one thing, uh, a number of people, Fessenden, uh, Lita Forrest, um, and uh, uh, I'm forgetting, Anthony, uh, anyway, one, one other fellow developed uh, the ability to transmit voice. But for the most part in the teens, it was still Morse code. So no matter how sophisticated your means of transmission, it was still a series of dots and dashes. And the importance of this to the world was illustrated by a tragedy. So in April of 1912, the Titanic goes down and the Marconi wireless operator was able to get in touch with the Carpathia, which ended up saving 700 lives um, on uh, the Titanic. But at the same time, in Wanamaker's department store in New York, there was a young man named David Sarna, who was running the wireless station there. That was just one of the places where the Marconi company had put their, uh, their transmitters. And there's a lot of legends about what Sarnoff did or did not do. One thing is clear is that he stayed at his key for a long time, whether he was there from the very beginning and what exactly he did uh, has been lost to myth, but he transmitted news of this to the rest of the world. He transmitted uh, news about the survivors to the families, and, uh, uh, and so it made his reputation. And he would go on to be uh, the chair of RCA and then later the founder of the National Broadcasting Company. So this great tragedy was involved in the history of broadcasting in America. But he was a visionary thinker. And as I said, up to this point, almost all of radio was uh, ship to shore, ship to ship. People weren't thinking about it as a commercial enterprise. But as the voice transmission became more possible, he had an idea. And it's unclear exactly when he wrote this memo. Um, somewhere between 1915 and 1920. But he was a visionary. And when you see this, it reminds me a little bit of a short story that Woody Allen once wrote about the Earl of Sandwich inventing the sandwich and having experiments and saying, like, today I put uh, uh, a piece of bread between two pieces of turkey. I'm getting close, you know. It, uh, <laughs> trying to understand what the possibilities were for the new technology was not that easy. And it, looks, uh, it looks obvious to us today. But what he said was, I have in mind a plan of development which would make radio a household utility in the same sense as the piano or the photograph. The idea is to bring music into the house by wireless. The receiver can be designed in the form of a simple radio music box and arranged for several different wavelengths, which should be changeable with the throwing of a single switch or pressing of a single button. Events of national importance can be simultaneously announced and received. Baseball scores can be transmitted. Concerts, lectures, music recitals. Why well, have indicated a few of the most probable fields of usefulness for such a device, yet there are numerous other fields to which the principle can be extended. Now, this was revolutionary thinking back then. Nobody had quite thought of what you could do with this new technology. Um, so, and as you can see, this anticipates virtually everything that commercial media went into. Uh, in fact, one of the first things that uh, the radio transmitted was the World, uh, the America's Cup boat race and then the presidential election in 1920 which is ironic because Cox and Harding were both newspaper moguls and radio was the first thing, it was the first time that radio had covered uh, an event like that. So what he envisioned, instead of just point to point, was setting up antennas all over the place um, and reaching a wide group of people. And the name for this came from agriculture because in agriculture there's two types of ways 
to plant seeds. You can do furrowed rows, or you can take a sack and toss the seeds across a large area, hoping they take root. And the word for that from agriculture is broadcasting. And so that became what Sarnoff had in mind. And it worked, uh, except World War I intervened. As I said before, any new technology, the government's going to be very interested in it, and especially when it can be used to transmit very valuable information to your Navy and your troops, but it can also be intercepted by the enemy and used for their troops. And so the Navy confiscated all radio equipment during the First World War and uh, didn't want anybody to have it. And when the war was over, they wanted to retain control of radio. But too many amateur kits had been released before. They could not contain it. And so they tried to do the next best thing, which is control it in a way through private enterprise, which is how RCA was formed. So they took, the American Marconi Company was suspicious because of the ties to England. Um, we were very concerned, the government was concerned that the British would have our secrets. If, they were, if we were using their hardware, they might be able to uh, get our secrets. So they actually forced Marconi to sell. And so Marconi Wireless uh, becomes the Radio Corporation of America. And the, and the principal holders of that were GE, which manufactured equipment and had certain patents, uh, Westinghouse Electric, AT&T, and curiously enough, the Amer United Fruit Company, because <laughs> as the technology was being developed, they saw the use of it, and it was very important for them with their fleets to be able to know where storms were and how to avoid uh, losing their produce. So that's Radio Corporation of America, and it takes off like wildfire. In 1921, they broadcast a boxing match with Dempsey versus Cartier and it reaches 300,000 people. By 1924, RCA has sold over $80 million worth of radios. And so Sarnoff asks, could a commercial broadcast network be financed by sales alone of radios? And the answer is no. You'd have to sell advertising. Now, for those of you from other countries, from England, Italy, France, this is not the way that the airwaves were handled. They were kept very tightly controlled by the government. But here, the air was for sale. So, in 1926, the National Broadcasting Company launches. A year later, Columbia Broadcasting System. In 1927, things were going so well, NBC splits this program into two networks, the Red Network and the Blue Network. The Red was mostly entertainment and sports, and the Blue Network was news. I think I got that right. Um, then the Mutual Broadcasting Company is the only one of the initial big radio companies that didn't make the transition to TV successfully. There still is a mutual uh, network, I think, uh, but it's not nearly uh, on, on the scale of, of what the others were. Then in 1943, the Federal Communications Commission decides that NBC has too big a monopoly. They have to split off one of their networks, so they split off the blue network, which becomes ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And so that's the lineup that kind of took us into the dawn of television. I mean, television had been around since the late 20s, but really didn't take off until the 50s. Uh, in the 40s, all the networks had something on the air, but the medium didn't take off to the 50s. I think in 1946, there was something like 6,000 TVs, and by like 1952, there were 12 million TVs that had been sold. So it was the fastest selling technology. And then at some point, I think 95% of American homes had, yes? What was the trigger that, that made people go from there was no TVs to everyone wanted the TV? What was the trigger that made people go from no TV to everything? I think it was probably, um, I'm no historian, but it's a good question. I think it was likely probably the price of the, of the units that as they got more sophisticated with the manufacturing, the price goes down. <laughs> Programming comes up, and people say, look what you can do. And, uh, and then the old American system of keeping up with the Joneses. Ah, well, Lorian's family has a TV. Why don't we have a TV? And so, um, and, it, and, it, and it quickly caught on like that. But I suspect that the availability of better sets, better reception, lower price uh, had to do with it. 
And what's interesting also, and this is very uniquely American, uh, most network programs are owned by the sponsors uh, and, uh, and produced by the advertising agencies. The networks have limited control over their schedules. Advertisers brought available time periods and scheduled at their will. Networks rented out the studio facilities to ad agencies to produce the shows. So you had things like one of the first famous shows in Norton Borough, but that was the Texaco Star Theater. That's a gas company, a gasoline company. The Camel News Caravan with John Cameron Swayze. Goodyear Tires, Television Playhouse, and this was the days of the great anthology shows, but they were all sponsored by these big companies. The U.S. Steel Hour, there was the Alcoa Hour, there was um, Dinah Shore and the Chevy Show. I grew up listening to her, so see the USA in your Chevrolet. Perry Como with the Kraft Music Hall, Kraft the Food Company. And then this all kind of came to a screeching halt or a thud with a quiz show called 21 uh, because it was very, very popular. It was sponsored by Geritol, which is a multivitamin iron supplement. But it turned out that Charles Van Doren, this very charismatic participant in the show, who was the son of a famous Columbia professor, was cheating. They were feeding him the answers. And there was a movie that was made called Quiz Show that went into that. And that brought the whole house of cards down. And, and suddenly the network said, you know, maybe we should take more control over what we're putting on the air and not let the advertisers have free reign like that. And that's kind of what then fed into uh, the TV system that eventually evolved into to what I came into. TV shows were written very much like radio shows were written. You know, radio had developed a system of um, and, and it, it was a factory floor approach, but it was able to put a good product on the air every week and uh, under tight deadline pressures. So you had a non-writing producer who could come up with the idea or a piece of intellectual property. They didn't call it that back then, they called it a book um, but, um, or a play. But uh, anyway, they would put that together and they would have a story editor who was actually a story editor. Um, and then it was mostly written by freelancers because the shows were not um, serialized to the same, I mean, there were soaps and things like that that were different, but, but for the most part, there were what we call in the business one-offs. In other words, every week is a self-contained story. And so um, if, uh, if Armando has an idea, he pitches his story. If Meg has an idea, she pitches her story. And we say, yeah, go write it, go write it. And, and they come in, they get some notes, and it goes on the air. Comedy and variety shows relied on in-house staffs and sometimes under the direction of the star. I mean, this is a lot from your show of shows, Sid Caesar, Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, uh, Neil Simon was part of that. So that's always been a little different about, uh, about comedy. But in the early days of American television, like a lot of radio, uh, like a lot of what television did, they just copied what was done in radio, not just the style of how they wrote, but the actual content. So Gunsmoke, which was a hugely popular TV show, began as a radio show. And there were 480 of those shows, 52 to 61, and then simultaneously, beginning in 55, they put it on television, and that ran for 20 years. So just an indication of, uh, of the overlap between radio and television. And it's kind of the old, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I often think about the early broadcast days and, and even the days I came into it, about like the car companies. We had three big car companies in the United States. And essentially, they all made the same car. Um, but I like the fins on this one. I like the chrome on this one. You know, it, there weren't a lot of technical differences. I'm not a car person. I'm sure people will disagree. But essentially, they all had their sedan, their family wagon, you know, their sports car. And uh, yes? Would they adapt the what? Would they adapt some of the radio episodes into television episodes? Would they rewrite the radio episodes? Uh, I'm not sure. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it, for the longest times, even TV shows would kind of imitate each other. And the old timers would say, you know that thing we did on Rockford Files? And now we're working on something. You know, let's just give it a haircut. Give it a haircut. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and we'll put it on. So there was a lot of, yeah. You know, as, as, the T, as the radio pundit Fred Allen said, uh, imitation is the highest form of television. And, uh, <laughs> and that was the way it went. Um, but what's interesting is under that freelance system, you could put a lot of shows on the air. 39 was the typical season. Um, how many is it today in broadcast? 15, 10. Well, in broadcast? 22. 22, right. 
But what they did, and it was very much influenced by radio. I mean, again, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, nobody thought that reruns would work in radio. So you did 39 shows, and then you do 13 either stunt shows or something else for the balance of the year. But, but when they began to realize that, you know what, we could repeat it, and the audience will actually sit for it uh, in TV, they started cutting down the number of episodes. So when you got to 22, you could show every episode twice, and then just stunt eight episodes a year. Or if you wanted to, you can repeat one uh, a third time. Um, back then, an hour of television had 52 minutes of story content. It was all regulated by the government and eight minutes of commercials. What is the screen time of a broadcast show on American television today? Uh, 42. 42, yeah, like 42 and a half. So twice as much advertising. Um, and, and I say this because with admiration for how much work they had to do. 52 minutes as opposed to, I mean, those scripts had to be over 60 pages, whereas now we're often 52 pages um, uh, for a script. 39 times, uh, I shudder. And, uh, and like I said, it wasn't with an in-house staff, it was mostly freelance. And this is the way it kind of worked financially. Now this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but I think it's important to understand again, especially for our international uh, guests here, that uh, why it developed the way it did in our country. The studio, pitches the show. They're the ones that are going to make it. The network orders a pilot. This is the way it would work. Here's the idea for the first episode. The studio then finances the pilot at a loss because the network picks up the series and then pays the license fee. Then they order the pilot, they'll say, we'll give you, let's just say, a million dollars. And suppose it costs you a million and a half dollars to make the pilot. Okay, you eat that 500,000. Why? We'll get to that. Um, same thing with the series. They'll say, we'll pay you you know, let's say with a million dollars an episode, and it's going to cost you a million and a half per episode. Every time you make an episode, you're out $500,000. You do that, but here's the key. You own it, okay? So the idea was, if I can keep this show on the air, see, the network's making their money in real time by selling advertising. If your show does well, they can charge advertisers more, and they make their money that way. You are losing money as the studio until you have enough shows that you can put it into the syndication market. Now, it used to be when you came home from school, right, Phil, you could watch a show in the afternoon, or at 10.30 at night, you could watch a show that had done very well. And the magic number for syndication was 100 episodes. If you could get your show to 100 episodes, they could strip it. The rules were different. You could actually cut some stuff out of it so you could put more advertising on it at an off-prime time time. And uh, so everybody was happy with that. Sometimes I've seen shows in mine that were stripped. I'm thinking, they just cut out the most important plot point, but it didn't matter. And you know, they, 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 they made their sale. And that's where people made huge amounts of money. Shows like The Cosby Show, um, Magnum P.I. I mean, suddenly they could, because you, when you syndicate, you're not just going to one buyer. You're going to every individual market in the United States and selling it. And whatever the market will bear, you sell it. So one episode, you could make 50, 60 million dollars per episode, depending on what people were willing to pay for it. Think about things like Friends or Seinfeld now too, you know, that, those, that, that inventory is golden. So that's where one hit can pay for a lot of failures, and that was the system. Okay. Things began to change, not just because the networks began to realize they didn't have to make as many shows, but shows began to show real improvement on a consistent basis for a very clear reason, because writers were getting more control. The Mary Tyler Moore Studios, started by Grant Tinker, who had been an NBC executive, was one of the first that really got the public's attention to saying, this is a terrific show, and what Grant Tinker did in forming his company is he found some of the best and brightest writers and said, I'm gonna treat you like individuals, I'm not gonna treat you like factory workers, as most studios did, and I'm gonna pay you less up front, but I'm gonna give you back end, and I'm gonna back you creatively. And so, Mary Tyler Moore Show came out of that, the Bob Newhart Show, a lot of other shows. MASH came out of that same ethos, even though it wasn't MTM Studios. But you know that Larry Gelbart, brilliant writer, uh, was responsible for turning that movie into, uh, into a series. And it really wasn't about Korea, it wasn't about the Korean War, it was really about Vietnam. Um, and so it was a, a clever way to talk to the audience, talk to the Americans about what was going on. So that was in 72. Then Hill Street was a hugely important show out of MTM that revolutionized drama, even though it almost went off the air. 
if Brandon Tartikoff's wife Lily hadn't believed in it, it probably would have been yanked. And it barely stayed on the air, and then it won every Emmy in sight, so they couldn't kill it. Uh, but it was never a ratings hit, curiously enough. St. Elsewhere followed in that same fashion. Some people called that Hill Street in the hospital, and, and it pretty much was, but it was great, among other things, Denzel Washington. Uh, that was one of his early roles. Then a show I'm particularly fond of, um, <laughs> Northern Exposure, which was created by, um, <laughs> by Josh Brand and, and, and John Falsey, who had worked on, created St. Elsewhere and worked on another MTM show, White Shadow, which was a pioneering show about a white basketball coach in an inner city school. So things began, and then ER became this phenomenal hit. Uh, and that really began to create more public interest in what a showrunner was about. And according to my very inexact and unscientific research, um, 1995 was the first time the word showrunner was used in a public, a, a widely circulated public forum. And it was in the story about John Wells. And this is what it said. For the last 10 years, at least, the person with that unofficial title has been the true auteur of series television. Day to day, a showrunner makes all important decisions about the series' scripts, tone, attitude, look, and direction. He or she oversees casting, production design, and budget. This person chooses directors and guest stars, defends the show against meddling by the network or production company, and when necessary, changes its course. It is the unusual ability to be at once a creative wellspring, a capable team leader, and a bottom line administrator that makes an effective showrunner such a rare commodity. And then the show went on to talk about, I mean, the article went on to talk about Hill Street. Hill Street Blues, with its story arcs that stretched over several episodes and its rapidly evolving regular characters, changed the medium in ways not really understood at the time. It meant that a show had to have a large and very competent permanent full-time writing staff, Mr. Wells pointed out. In the old days on shows like Mannix or Hawaii Five-0, the main characters didn't change much. The episodes could be written and run in any order, which is very important for syndication, by the way. And so producers lined maybe one or two, hired maybe one or two story editors who, formed, who found out most of the scripts to freelance writers, as we've discussed. But then, as the shows became increasingly complex, working on a character level as well as a plot level. It became obvious that freelancers wouldn't be able to keep up with the character's development. So increasingly, people were brought onto staff because they had to be right there to know all the things that were happening to the characters. This was a huge change, uh, a huge shift for the freelance market. And a lot of people who had made comfortable livings as freelancers found themselves out in the cold. Um, I got into... Uh, <laughs> It was, it was really an uncomfortable situation at a Writers Guild meeting when I was fairly new. I was working on Remington Steel, so I was very new. And they were talking about what had happened to the freelance market. And I said, well, from where I'm sitting, I said, it's like, it's like baseball. It's like being on staff is the big leagues and being a freelancer is the minor leagues. You're either on your way up or you're on your way down. And I was just trying to tell it like it is. And some old time writer with some terrific credits said, that's the first time in my career I've ever been called a minor leaguer. And I said, that's not what I meant, but I never went to one of those meetings again. Um, <laughs> but, but it was true. I mean, that is what had happened. And this guy and many others were very used to making a comfortable living, just wandering in and doing what they wanted. Not only would they write a variety of one-hour shows, but I remember talking to writers, because I've always been very curious uh, about this. In, in my book, I quote in the acknowledgments Richard Levinson of Levinson and Link, who created uh, uh, Columbo and Murder, She Wrote. He, he, he said, Melvoin, he said, you're like Diogenes with his lamp. You know, you're always looking for one well-run show. And, uh, and I was, because I was very curious about it. But, um, so I would, I would talk to the older writers that I knew when I was starting, and they said, yeah, well, I would write a Bonanza, I would write a, uh, uh, a Dick Van Dyke show, I would write an I Spy, I would write a Gomer Pyle in the same year. I thought, well, that's really interesting. Not only that, they could make a living off of that. That's even more interesting, but um, you couldn't do that anymore. Anyway. Uh, Continuing John's comment, that led, as the stories became more complex, to the realization that what slowed shows down the most was the lack of good writers. So if you wanted a really good writer on a show, that writer increasingly demanded more creative control. And so, kaboom. <laughs> and the attitude was kind of like the road warrior talking to those besieged citizens you want to get out of here, you talk to me. Um, 
It really was, if you needed somebody with those qualities that that article was talking about, you needed somebody who not only had the, you know, had the ability, but had the confidence and a little bit of swagger to say, I can pull this off and you need to go through me. So just as a bit of historical reflection, talking about now the distinction between film and television and what was going on during this period. In the golden age of the Hollywood studio system, you had the mogul on top, who controlled the studio, which all the creative elements of the studio, writers, directors, actors, were all under direct contract to the studio, and the studio had the theaters. You had completely vertically integrated distribution, which was great for them, but the American government decided it wasn't so great for the public. So in 1948, in the famous case, U.S. versus Paramount Pictures, antitrust law was invoked, and it was ruled that you could no longer have that degree of vertical integration. And so, Goodbye to that system. And in its place, filling the vacuum, what became the most important element, who became the most important element in making movies? The director. And since then, the director has really been the straw that stirs the drink, in most cases. So you have the director, and then actors are important, certainly. But there's no question that the least important are the writers. Because um, they're expendable. But the director became hugely important. And in TV, which as we've seen was uh, based on the radio model, originally you had a non-writing producer who was extremely important. Um, you, know, you might remember uh, uh, Sheldon Leonard did uh, uh, he did the Dick Van Dyke show and, and a number of other shows. He did I Spy. Um, I'm trying to remember that uh, Quinn Martin, remember Quinn Martin? Uh, QM production, you know, those. Anyway, with the rise of the showrunner, that became the writer-producer's meeting. So that's just a little bit of reflection. So this represents kind of the conventional way at the height of showrunner power what things look like. I put the showrunner on the same level as the network and studio. The network and studio control the money, but look who controls the troops. Look who reports to whom. Now, this is very simplified, but essentially everybody reports to and through the showrunner. Now, the producer's unit is going to be talking to the studio, and the director is going to be talking to the cast, but the showrunner is in charge of all key creative departments. And I think there's a risk, even when, at this point, of talking about auteurs, because just like the French theory, um, it's, we're in a collaborative business. And it's important that we recognize people who have vision and really do drive the vision of a show, but, um, whether it's a film or a TV show, but they don't do it alone. And so there's always a little bit of a risk of elevating any one person uh, to such a high level. But of course, plenty of showrunners were happy to take that credit. But, um, but the best ones, they share the, they share the praise widely, and they know um, you know, how it's done, which isn't to minimize the importance because it really is important, but it is to say you can't do it without a huge team and relying on a lot of good people. So some fun facts to know about showrunning. It's an unofficial term. You won't find it in any WGA contract. In fact, people can't even agree on how to spell it. <laughs> a quick look at the job itself. <laughs> what does it consist of? You're in charge of all three key areas of making a show. Prep, which involves outline, scripts, notes, you're going to see that reappear. Casting, director, uh, the heads of department. We used to call them department heads, but now I think the European model has caught on and we call them HODs. Do you guys do that? Um, you call them department heads? You probably don't call them anything. Okay. <laughs> um, budget, then actual production, shooting. You have set issues, dealing with actors, directors, others. There's always the crisis of the day to be dealt with, and you get more notes. And then in post-production, you have final cuts. So you're involved with the editing. You get notes from the studio and the network. You spot music. You spot sound. You go to playback, the final mix. All of that is uh, part of your responsibility. And the thing is, depending on your platform, you're doing all of this while continuing to generate new scripts. Now, this is show running at its fullest. Um, even when all scripts are written in advance of production, which we know is a fiction, um, <laughs> ongoing revisions will be needed to address problems related to budget, practicality, executive notes, director notes, actor notes, and acts of God. 
The showrunner is responsible for all of these changes. Other things, you're involved with publicity, marketing, product placement. I remember once we had our other line in Alias which says, quick, get in that truck, the F-150. <laughs> <laughs> Transmedia, the internet, web pages, additional content, like webisodes, electronic press kits. Um, all of this stuff can be distractions when you're running a show. Social media, the video game, the comic book, clothing, and the lunchbox, as I say. <laughs> and what I tell people in the showrunner program is, these are all important, but you can't do them all. Uh, and, and if they want you to do this, then you can't keep the mothership going. So don't get distracted by this. Um, in terms of the importance of delegation, there's a very important expression, which is, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And so you've got to decide what you're going to do and what you're going to give other people to do. And even if you think you're the best at everything, if you're a conductor and you're conducting a symphony, you can't run from music stand to music stand playing every instrument while you're conducting at the same time. So um, you have to decide where you're going to put your time. And then finally, this is the job. Also, hiring, firing, hand-holding, scolding, cheerleading, negotiating, controlling, firefighting, inspiring, and you repeat until exhaustion or cancellation. <laughs> and you do it, this will look eerily familiar and might bring some PTSD out among people who've actually been in one of these rooms, but uh, this is the typical writer's room. I won't go into all what this represents, but uh, everything's there for a reason, including the candy and, uh, and other stuff. And usually a room is run in a, it's a benign autocracy, and it's ruled by a very meritocratic principle, which is the best idea wins, as determined by the autocrat. Yeah. So one of the things about running a room is, is and, and, and I think Meg was saying this yesterday, somebody has to be in charge. You know, you can't just work in a vacuum. And that's the person that you're trying to help sometimes persuade, or if it's you, you're making decisions, and at some point you have to say, okay, we're going left, we're not going right. And, and then you move on. If you don't, you're just gonna be circling the drain for the rest of the day. Look, again, we're talking about show running at the height of its birth and development. So here's a day in the life of a showrunner, like in the second season of a 22 episode order. And each color here represents a different episode. So count how many episodes this showrunner is dealing with in the course of the day. So episode 10 begins shooting day two on location. Now, according to most schedules, the way I was brought up, that means that it's day one of prep on the next show. So they're up early, and the important thing about that is you're sitting there in your bed, and your crew has been out there already for a number of hours, and you've got to appreciate that and make sure that you give them their props and recognize how hard they're working. 6.15 to 7.30, you wake up, you read a writer's draft of episode 13, it needs work. Yeah. Eight to nine, you get to the office, you continue yesterday's rewrite of episode 12, you get a call from the set, a lead actor's having trouble with a line, you cancel lunch. Now, technically, lead actors should not be having troubles with a line because you want your scripts to be ready on time, and, and most of us have what's known as the 24-hour rule. If we got you the script on time, you can call me anytime, up to 24 hours before the scene is shot, and I'm not gonna take the call if, if it's after that because I won't have time to give it its full consideration. So you have to respect my time if I respect your time by getting the script on time. It's a nice theory, um, and, it, and it does work most of the time, but, but not always. So this is a rather hyperbolic uh, example, so we threw it in there. Um, you have a concept meeting with the director on episode 11. Like I said, day two of uh, shooting is day one, actually, of prep on the next episode. There's two really important meetings with the director, the way I was brought up in the system. One at the beginning of prep, one at the end. The concept meeting is essentially your time to listen to the director, you go through the script from front to back, questions about everything. Um, that uh, It opens up in a cafe and it says that the writer's typing on an Apple laptop. Does it have to be an Apple laptop? Um, does it have to be a cafe? We can find, you know, all sorts of questions come up that need to be answered. And there's some questions of interp too. But for the most part, it's really just physically how are we going to get this done? What do you see? What's demanded? Can we, you know, and you've got department heads there too and they're going to ask questions. And one hour is too short for that, but yeah. again. Um, so then you give notes to right episode 13, that's the one you begin reading. You look at a casting tape for an uncast part on episode 10. And the reason that's in there is because even though the thing is shooting, you're not done with it. It's, things happen, actors fall out, uh, other things happen, so you may still be getting called and nagged at the ankles by something that has to do with what's shooting. 
So then you get studio notes in episode 14 outline. So that's coming down. You're shooting episode 10, and you've already given them the outline on 14, and they don't like it, which is always great. Um, so now you're sitting with the editor for the final notes on the producer's cut of episode 8. Okay, so we're going backwards now. Everything up to this point has been going forwards. Now we're going backwards. So the order of things is that when you're given a director's cut, you turn that into the producer's cut that goes to the studio. They give you notes. That becomes the basis for the network cut. Then you lock that cut, and then that's what you spot and, and post. Um, so this is an episode that is going to go to, uh, to the studio, so you work with that. You get a crisis call from the set that you lost in the afternoon location. Again, this is there as a bit of hyperbole. These things happen, but usually a good line producer will solve these problems without getting you involved, because what can you do? If, it, if it's, we've really lost a location and we can't find any alternative, then you may need to get involved and say, what else can we shoot today? Or how can we rewrite this scene to get it done today? And that may involve you. So then you do music, sound, and FX spotting in episode six. So that's going back two more episodes. That one's locked, it's done, and now kind of the fun part begins. I always sit in on the music spotting myself. I love music, I love movie music in particular, and that's always my oasis. I get to sit with the composer and talk about the music. Um, sound and FX spotting, I usually delegate. Some people do them at the same time, uh, but I find that it kind of confuses things, and I, I can delegate the other two, but I'll do the sound, I'll do the music myself. Um, then you get the network notes in episode 12, which you're already rewriting. They have problems. Um, this is something I used to do because, um, yeah, you, you have to. Now, today you might not have to cancel it because you could do it by, uh, by Zoom, but, um, uh, and it might be important to do that. But, um, but in any case, uh, sometimes this is what I would call the Hail Mary thing. I, I knew the episode needs work, so I'm rewriting it in anticipation of the network notes. Um, you go to the writer's room, you work on episode 15 outline for an hour and a half. Uh, and you approve a prop design for episode 10 and you review episode 14 notes with the writer. Um, one of the things that's not accurate about this for the way I like to run a show is that I spend the majority of my daylight hours in the writer's room with the writers. I try to arrange things so that I could be there, but it's just to kind of demonstrate um, all the different things that are going on. You have to arrange your schedule. There's no, nothing more important than, uh, than the script and the outlines. And, and in the show under training program, there's a mantra. I say, if there's only four things, four words that you take away from these next six weeks, it's quality scripts on time. You have to write a good script, and you better get it in on time, or it's not going to be a quality episode. Or if it is, it's going to cost a lot of money, and if you do that too often, they're going to remove you. So anyway, uh, this is a little inaccurate, but again, just to remind you of all the responsibilities. And then you get studio nuts on the concept of episode seven. You cancel your dinner plans, and then you ask studio for breakage for a guest star role in episode 11. That's when you're going above your pattern budget and you need more money for a particular actor that you want. And you continue to write of episode 12 and you go home to watch dailies of episode 10. When I came up in the business, believe it or not, we're working on something called film. And, uh, and to watch dailies, you had to book time at the studio's screening room. And it was very much pecking order, which show was doing well, which got the best times to look at film. But you had to watch every frame of everything that was shot. It was a tremendous time suck. The only thing that was kind of cool is it was kind of like the old movie that the executive producer would sit down and go roll it, and he'd have the editor next to him and give notes. But it was, to me, a tremendous time suck. It's great that you can now get dailies by other means and watch it at your leisure. You need to watch them very promptly, but you can watch them at your leisure. So that's the, uh, the day in the life. Did anybody keep track of how many episodes that was? Uh, it was nine, I think. Um, so, and it's an extreme example. And it reminds me, when I was working on Hill Street, we used to have great second ADs and great background extras. And whenever we shot in Hill Street Station, they would always be sending these people in front of the camera and behind other people, and then they'd get to one side of the set and go off camera, and then they'd wait a second and be sent back in the other direction. It was great for atmosphere. And having been a journalist for seven years before uh, I got into this business, I'd been in a lot of police stations, and uh, in New York and San Francisco and elsewhere, and um, I will tell you that at its uh, busiest, no New York police precinct is as busy as Hill Street was on its laziest day. <laughs> and yet, cops would tell you, I love that show, that's exactly the way it is. 
And I realized, no, that's not exactly the way it is. It's exactly the way it feels. And that's our job as artists, is to create the way that it feels. And that's kind of the point of this, too. This may not be exactly the way it is, but anybody who's been in charge of a show, this is the way it feels. Okay, so you all that, add all that up, and one of the people that went through the show in her program, Liz Friedman, who took on her first show, she came back and she told the class, show running is like being beaten to death <laughs> with your own dreams. <laughs> So, so be careful what you wish for, um, because uh, it, it can rebound on you in funny ways. In fact, one of the things we have to watch out for in the showrunner program is not making it sound like it's like, why would anybody want to do that? Um, I remember particularly talking to the Writers Guild of Great Britain, and we'll get into comparative systems next, and uh, another of them said, why would you possibly want to do that? Um, so. It is time to take a look now about the comparison. Again, we're still staying at the peak of show running. So when you take a look at the American system and everybody else, it's a clash of cultures, markets, and resources. Here's us, and here's the world, and by comparison, we dwarf everybody in terms of the way we've been able to develop a system to turn out a lot of shows, uh, quality shows, in a, in a relatively short period of time. But it is changing, as we'll get into. So the cultures, this is a quick look. I, I worked on season three of Killing Eve. And so I, I had some first-hand experience on uh, what it's like to work on one show uh, in, in England, and um, you can't extrapolate too far from there, but I've talked to a lot of friends and colleagues, and uh, I feel pretty comfortable about the generalizations that follow. Um, so in the American system, we've seen that the media grew up under corporate control, that private enterprise, the capitalist impulse, is what drives our business. We're in it to make money. And Phil referred to that too. We like to put fannies in the seats. You know, that's ultimately the goal of what we're doing. Um, it's a Wild West ethos. Nobody in Hollywood cares where you came from or where you went to school. I mean, it might help open doors, but at the end of the day, all that matters is can you do the job? And uh, so you get some fantastic characters that come into Hollywood and a lot of con, but the fact is, um, it doesn't matter where you're from. You can leave your past behind and reinvent yourself in Hollywood. We have a very strong writers' union. Really strong. And it's been hugely important uh, to the growth of writing in American television. And it leads to the most important distinction between America and anywhere else in the world when it comes to television. The writer is viewed as both labor and management. Okay? And that didn't come because management decided to be nice. It came because we demanded it and we struck for it in various different ways, and we're striking for it now. Now, you compare that to England. The government controlled the airwaves, and for a long time continued to. There's, there's much more freedom of access now in the UK, but BBC was, and still remains, a, a heavy influence. And it's government-funded, and this was alluded to yesterday, but too, that, because that, uh, Phil's had experience with it. Almost anything that's done overseas involves some measure of government funding. Uh, state funding, and a part of their producer's job, I'm, I have so much admiration for people that do this job other places, because for the last two years I've, I've uh, led a seminar for the uh, Film Institute of Cologne for a show and a training program they do there with 12 different people from 12 different European countries, and part of their job is assembling the financing to even get their show off the ground. Uh, that's part of what they need to do before they can even begin to to get into it. So government funding is important, and of course that comes with strings. Then the people that ruled the BBC and continue to influence, I think, the media in England have what's known as the Oxbridge ethos, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, there's very still um, strong vestiges of the class system in the UK. I'm happy for somebody to disagree with me, but I don't think you will. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's changing. I mean, there are a lot of uh, people who are elbowing their way into it but it still is very much paternalistic. Even if women are playing that role, I would call it a paternalistic type of system. They have a notoriously weak union, and since Margaret Thatcher, most unions in the UK are very weak. Uh, so they, their union has very little teeth, and there's some wonderful people there, but they can't do anything on behalf of the writers. And the bottom line is that the writer is viewed as labor only. And you know, we think that the British revere their bards, and they may, but they don't treat them with any respect when it comes to production. As uh, Emma Frost, terrific writer-producer who went to the show in her program, she's British, and she said they, 
You, you, you turn in the script, they pat you on the head and say, now you go back in the sandbox and let the adults take over. And uh, there's an additional um, gender component to that if you're a woman doing that, and that's not true not just in England, but in other places too. Because to kind of crack that ceiling, often those positions are held by men, and you need somebody to champion you, whether it's a producer or a director, and those positions have traditionally been held by men. So it's uh, how to get respect as labor and management, how to earn your place at the table. That's a real challenge for folks working there. Yes. Yeah, there, there are exceptions. Um, who did you just mention? Sam Bain. Right, and there's, and, and who's the woman that did? Um, well, Julian Fellows. Uh, well, Julian Fellows is an, an example. I mean, you can pick out Jed Mercurio as another guy who, who I know a little bit. I mean, you, 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 you know, um, uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Uh, they are the exceptions. And uh, just like you can find exceptions here. Yes? Now, some of them have their own companies. It's slightly different, but they are, so I'm from, I'm from, Right. Even whoever the writer is still has to obey the, the, the broadcasters and the uh, uh, board out. Yes, yeah, so it's 100%. It's the appearances that they do, Flash and Data. Right, because that seems to write every episode. Like Friday nights, it's like the same writer has written every episode. Like it seems like it's their show, what you're saying. Yeah, every episode rewritten. is rewritten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, you, you can, um, yeah, what do you, you don't call it rewriting in, in the UK, you call it, uh, what's the word that they use? Um, it's, it's, it's like not redrafting, or overwriting, overwriting they call it. Um, uh, yeah, and, um, but it, it's, it, 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 and the exceptions I think prove the rule. Uh, but it is, there's a lot more control from the non-writing perspective. Um, and we can talk more specifically about that and I'm happy to do that after. Um, so this is the conventional broadcast organizational chart that we talked about before. And if you look at the British chart, it is very different. You see where the writer is. It's not even a showrunner. It's the lead writer. That's not a term that we normally use. And there's this position called script editor, which is really strange. And, and I thought a script editor was just like a writer's assistant. No, the script editor actually works for the studio or the commissioner. I, the, the language loses me half the time, but no, they don't work for you. Um, they, they work for the people that are financing it. And, uh, and when I, because we were interviewing writer's assistants and when they kept saying, no, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that, and I had to understand what the script editor position was and somebody explained it to me. They said, no, no, we, we go back to the studio and we get the notes and we relay them to you. I said, what? Uh, and I said, but you're not a writer, no. And you don't wanna be a writer, no. I wanna be a producer. I said, oh, I get it, so you're a spy. Um, <laughs> And they didn't like that. But, uh, and I've been told by writers that actually there can be very good s script editors and they can be very helpful. But as a position, I just find it distinctively odd. And, um, and so that exists there. Uh, and the lead writer, as you can see, who reports to the lead writer? Only the writers, and I don't even refer to them as writers, I refer to them as the script department because that's the way they're reviewed. The script department is only one more thing like wardrobe, props, you know. Look, everybody that contributes to the show is important but it begins with the writers, but they're not treated with any more distinction than that, in my opinion. So uh, it's, it's, a strange, uh, it's a strange coalition, and it may be changing, but uh, to try to get from that lead writer position up is, is difficult. Yes? No, I was just saying that the script editor is actually a legacy of how the uh, long running shows the day, the soap operas, basically, people that obviously mm -hmm. were organized in the 60s, so it's a legacy of that system. Right, so it, it was saying that the, the position came about the way that soap operas were done, yeah, and gosh. like a lot in our business, once somebody gets their foot in the door, uh, they don't get it out unless they're forced out. So if the position- They were, they were long run, so they had to have that sort of system that was sort of stable, and it's basically the equivalent of our four, four, you know, four parent system. Of right, five. so it's kind of like the embryonic tail that we have. We should have, uh, evolution should have gotten rid of it. Yeah, but okay. Okay, <laughs> yes. So yeah, yeah, so you can conceive a show, but then even though you conceive a show and bring the idea to the, uh, to the studio, the broadcasters, you will get relegated to the script department. That's where you end up, even though you conceive the whole show. And Rex has been on shows. So yeah. You get right. relegated to the script department. Yeah, in fact, I, I, in, in this, uh, when I was talking to the Writers Guild of Great Britain, 
Uh, I was on a panel with Jed Mercurio, the very talented Jed Mercurio, who did uh, Bodyguard and did Line of Duty. And after Bodyguard, I thought, well, they must be rolling out the red carpet for you. And he said, no. And he said, I still have to get in line. And, and he said, I think they resent the fact that I have any influence like that. Now, people tell me Jed tells, it, it, he, he, I mean, Jed is very successful, but, but, but he said, he gave me a line that I used, which is, he said, what I try to do is influence what I can't control. And according to him, he can't control everything. But even after the show Bodyguard, it's not like they were coming to him and saying, what's your next idea? Uh, like he said, he thought they kind of resented the fact that a writer could somehow vaunt to the head of the class like that. Now, that may be just a little bit of self-promotion, but I think there's more than a little bit of truth to it as well. So, it's interesting what I found about differences in writers on the different sides of the pond. The UK writer, for the most part, I was so impressed. They reminded me of a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> Because they have to scramble for so much work, and it's not unusual that you'll find uh, a writer for your television show has just done a piece of theater. Um, they will have done uh, a radio play. Radio plays are still a thing in, in England, and they're quite entertaining. They'll do a film. They will do their television show. Um, they might write a piece of literature, they might write a book, or even do some journalism, and that's not unusual. And, it, and it creates great initiative, great innovation. Um, it, it's very entrepreneurial in that sense, but they're doing it because they have to survive, and there's just not enough work uh, if, they, if they just try to stay in one area. By contrast, the US writer <laughs> has, has one function, and that would be television. Um, although increasingly with, with peak TV, um, there's migration from film theater and, and journalism as well. But that's only increased, and that's a good thing, but it's increased the need for more education and apprenticeship because it's a very different form than, than any of those. Now, on the plus side, the US writer is a team player and is used to, in a room, being very generous. So you get um, people that have great ambition, which is a dirty word in the UK. You, you can't let anybody know that you really want something. You know? it, uh, <laughs> It's just not, not on, you know? Um, but, you, and you can't be too proud or too good um, because th then you'll get taken down and paid. But by contrast, the UK writer is this solitary artist and is poor but proud. And, um, and so when you get a, a typical UK writer in a room and say, okay, uh, I want you to give up this idea so you know, we, can, we can work with John, John's story, why should I give my idea to John's story? You know, they're so used to working on their own material, they have to be kind of educated. So, no, John will give you ideas for yours, you're gonna give him an idea for, you know, and, and, it's, and it's a free exchange. It's not hardwired into the British system. This is just a real quick look, and, and you can see why opportunities are more limited. Uh, I did a program with the Australians as well, and so that's why I had those figures up there. Now these figures, um, have been skewed a little bit by what's happened with the strike and other things, but just comparatively speaking, the numbers are just so staggering in terms of what American television is going to spend compared to the rest of the world. And, of course, the height of absurdity was a billion dollars being spent on Amazon's uh, Lord of the Rings, but don't get me started. Um, <laughs> okay, so now we get to the second part of our drama. Our belief system's been established, our hero's feeling very comfortable. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> um, well, a really good writer about this, Eric Barno, who wrote a trilogy, uh, it was combined into one volume called Tube of Plenty. He said, since the dawn of history, each new medium has tended to undermine an old monopoly, shift the definitions of goodness and greatness, and alter the climate of people's lives. And he wrote this in the 60s, okay? So just think about what's happened in the last 20 years. And so we do take a look at the world the way it was. <laughs> Those are the networks. You see you know, NBC in one corner and CBS, and they're all kind of happy. And then what happens? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so to get specific, what, what was that meteor that hit? Well, the first real sign of it was in 1999 with Sopranos when subscription television proved that they could compete on series level. HBO had been trying for years. By the way, there's a great book called this, It's Not TV, which is a history of HBO. And it's also at the same time a history of Netflix because they <coughs> together. 
really terrific piece of journalism talking about how HBO came to be what it was. And, and, it, and they struggled. You know, first they were showing sports, they were successful with sports, and they had comedy specials, but they could not crack the series business and, until The Sopranos. And there's a whole history behind The Sopranos. And then, when did House of Cards drop? Hmm? 2013, it was only 10 years ago that the universe was disrupted. And I remember thinking, oh, that'll never work, watching every show at once, you know, who wants to do that? Um, anyway, these, the, these two shows together proved that something other than broadcast television could get your attention and hold it and deliver a superior product, too. So, as I say, a moment of silence for the legacy media, and I genuinely feel sympathy for them. Uh, you know, since the great extinction event, known as Big TV, uh, essentially four business models have emerged in the United States, each with its own creative hierarchy. Now, this is getting into the weeds a little bit, and we're running, you know, we're going to finish on time, but I'm going to go through this because I do think, especially for our international participants, that this stuff is, is important. Um, so the four business models, there's traditional broadcast, and I'm going to go through this quickly, which is advertiser-driven, it uses the pilot process, it still favors 22 episodes per season, although that may be changing. It's weekly episodes utilizing act breaks, and for writers this is critically important with how you're writing your scripts. Do I have to write for commercials or can I make it seamless? The showrunner has considerable control over what goes on. Equity of participation for the showrunner, in other words, you have back end. Now my definition of back end is you, if you think you'll ever see anything. but. Um, <laughs> But the, I've always thought the most creative writing in Hollywood was done by the accountants, and that hasn't changed. But you do technically, if you have a big enough hit, they can't hide the profits. And you get residuals for writers, very important, and one of the planks of our strike right now. Basic cable is somewhat similar, very similar, but it's got some advertising and consumer fees. Pilot process, generally fewer episodes, still weekly episodes using app breaks. The showrunner has considerable control, there's still equity participation, and there's still residuals that you can calculate. Okay, now we move into the subscription world, and they may skip the pilot process. By the way, I understand that the gestation period at HBO can just be really long, too. The people who worked on things for a year or two or three, and they never come to fruition, so there's that aspect to it, too. The episodes are seamless, there's no act breaks. We won't take time to go into that now, but that can be a blessing and a curse. If, you don't, if it doesn't have to be 42 and a half minutes, if it can be 55 minutes, if it can be an hour and three minutes, that can be good in the right hands. It can also be bloated and uh, unfortunate in the wrong hands. Generally, weekly episodes, and then here's these meeting rooms, whereas the system that I was brought up under, you stayed on, you, you, you tried to get four or five scripts done before filming begins, and then you try to stay ahead as you go through the season. Here, presumably, you've written everything and you're sent home. So you get no exposure to prep, shooting, or post. The showrunner may have less control, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Limited equity and residual opportunities for showrunners, and there's more that can be said about that, but not here. Um, and then there's streaming, which also may skip the pilot process. Generally, fewer episodes, similar. All episodes drop at once. Binge watching is the goal, so there's certain demands depending on the studio for how you end every episode. They don't want you to say, you know, in four seconds, and that's they don't want you to switch away. They want you to keep going. Uses the mini rooms, and the showrunner generally has least control depending on, uh, and, and each one of these situations contextually can change depending on what's, uh, uh, what your particular situation is. But we'll take a look at what the, um, organization looks like for that. Um, within these models, and this is important, volume, pace, and budget are particularly critical factors that affect the showrunner's job and the preserved need for a showrunner. Generally, the greater the number of episodes, the tighter the production schedule, and the greater the emphasis on economy, the more persuasive the argument for the showrunner model becomes. With fewer episodes, fluid schedules, and deep pockets, some premium cable and streaming entities have veered away from the orthodox showrunning model, favoring directors and or aggregating more power for themselves, suggesting something of a convergence with the old Hollywood movie studio model or depending on the prism through traditional British and other European TV models. It's unclear how permanent these shifts may be. Anecdotal evidence suggests that even the most powerful studios and platforms are recognizing the need, at least in part, 
for the kind of vision, economy, and discipline that the showrunner model at its best can provide. There's a lot to unpack there. We're not going to do it right now, but those are important things. And if you've been following what's going on, there's a lot of speculation that Netflix and the others cannot survive without advertising. If they let advertising in, that's going to affect a lot of things that we do. And it may, in fact, encourage a return to more of the system that I grew up under uh, in the future. We'll see. So now there's convergence. Where are we going? This is the traditional chart that we saw. This is a potential streaming organizational chart where the showrunner and director seem to share responsibility, and the network and studio are clearly on top. Um, this would speak to the Marvel model, where the showrunner is referred to as the lead writer, um, depending on the circumstance. It's been changing somewhat. But there's no question, Marvel is at one end of the extreme. They have such a huge amount of uh, uh, intellectual property. They've got a total mythology that they control and they feel that they are the straw that stirs the drink, and you're lucky to be working for them, and depending on your attitude, yeah, you're right, okay, good, I get this opportunity, but you're not gonna have the same independence that you would in other situations. And the director and the showrunner they see operating at somewhat the same level, and by calling the showrunner the lead writer, they're making a very clear statement. Here's the British system, we talked about the script editor, and the way things are converging, and this is my biggest concern and fear is that with a little imagination, what does that look like? It looks like the way that movies were. Um, so that's my concern, is that, is that directors, and they'd be very happy to take that position. Now they can't do what a writer can do, and there's some very talented directors, but um, this is the way some people are leaning. And I know some very talented writers that work at HBO, and uh, Marty Noxon being one of them, who had a really tough time uh, with her show, uh, where the studio, and this is a female executive, was deferring to this male director who did not give her her props, did not give her much respect. And uh, it was very disturbing to hear her tell the class that. Okay, so that's the way things may be heading. Now let's take a little bit, look at specifically how women have been affecting show running, because they, in my opinion, have been having a very definite and positive impact on show running. First of all, the percentage of female showrunners have been ticking up. These numbers kind of surprise me, but they're pretty recent. Uh, so from 29.5% to 32.5%. Uh, women of color rose from 3.5 to 9.5. Women wrote or co-wrote the majority of episodes on network and half on streaming and 39% on cable. So writers achieved gender parity with 50.08% of episodes penned by women while the share of episodes directed by women increased from 36% to 40%, still not coming up to stuff in the pilot area, but still that's progress. In my own personal experience with the show and her training program, and, uh, which is a pretty interesting snapshot because it's by application only and we don't have any quotas. We, we do try to distinguish between half hour and one hour and try to accept people on the same ratio of applications that we get, which is usually two-thirds uh, drama and one-third comedy. Um, but in 2005, the first time we did the program, the class was two-thirds men and one-third women. In 2015, it was 55% women, 55% uh, men, 45% women. In 2016, the class was 50% men, 50% women. Since, 19, since 2016, the class has been over 50% women. And a couple years ago, the class was 70% women and 30% men. I mean, we had to, when we looked around at the end of the admissions process, said, do we have any guys at all? Um, and, uh, and what this reflects is the increase of, uh, it, it, uh, the change in the pool of applicants, because we truly do, we, we try to be as blind to who's applying as possible. And it's only that we get to the end of the process that we begin to look at, okay, do we have enough half hour, do we have enough hour, how are we split on gender, how are we split on, on a genre, and that sort of thing. So it really reflects that, uh, and there are a number of conclusions that there were possible suggestions you could make, but it shows that there weren't that many women in the pipeline 20 years ago. There are more women in the pipeline now, there are more women breaking through now, um, and uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's encouraging in that sense. Um, I did a little bit of an informal look that 
This is a very partial list of prominent female showrunners from around the world, mostly from here. The ones in green all were in the showrunner training program, either as uh, class participants or instructors. And I was kind of thrilled with that as well. Um, so a lot of terrific people there. Not enough time to go through every one of them, but there are uh, a lot of uh, talented women making good television. And in terms of the impact, in terms of the culture, um, I think that one of the areas that, that, that women showrunners have really had uh, an impact is on the quality of the experience of being in a writer's room and being part of the staff. We've all read the horror stories about what it's like to be in a toxic room with a toxic boss. And that's not to say that there can't be toxic women. There have been. Um, but as a rule, the, what I'm about to show you here is something that I don't think any man uh, that I worked with would ever have written. Um, there's a showrunner, Melinda Shue Taylor. She went through the program, uh, excellent showrunner. And she sends out an email to her incoming writers. And she lists very plainly, even before they come to the room for the first time, what her priorities are. Reach consensus on group agreements about how we collaborate, establish norms and protocols for creative interactions and decisions. Community outreach, she says, I'm a big believer in incorporating public service into our work life. Workshop on mindfulness strategies and guided meditation to help writers manage their anxiety and racing brains as a means to be more present, effective, and engaged in their lives and work. And then she says, here's some other windows into my brain, my notes to self about how to foster a writer and family friendly environment that also results in better work and a more fulfilling daily existence. Like I said, that's, um, that's a pretty remarkable um, statement in itself. And, and I think as a rule, um, it, it speaks for, you know, and, and, I, and I talk very advisedly here about feminine, masculine, male, female things, but it talks about a, um, what, what I consider in a very positive way, a, a feminine point of view that the business can use and, and profit from. And, uh, and, and just when we talk about gender, one funny story that comes to mind is we were doing a panel mm -hmm. for the showrunner training program and I had Carol Barbie up there who's a terrific showrunner and Vina Sood who's also a terrific showrunner. And uh, somehow the idea of persona came up because Carol, who is a mom, I think she has three children, said, I, I use my mom skills to control things on, on set. And she, she gave an example where an actor had said something that was really embarrassing when she was on it. And she kind of smiled and then she took him aside and she said, if you ever do that again. I mean, she reamed him. <laughs> and she got flowers the next day from the guy. The guy never stepped out of line again and said, that was my mom power. And I said, well, it's funny because on my shows, um, I hear them say, should we tell dad this? I don't think, you know. Um, <laughs> Because it turns out, like a writer of mine that I really admired on his show, turns out she was writing fan fiction, really lurid kind of quasi porn fan fiction on the site. And they said, I, I found this out years later, and we said, Well, should we tell dad? Nah, dad doesn't need to know this. So, <laughs> so I turned to Vina, who is, she did the killing, and she's a very strong, smart, brilliant woman. And I said, Vina, do you have a persona? She said, Yeah, definitely. She said, What? I'm dad. <laughs> I thought that was great. I mean, she knew who she was and, and how she liked to conduct business. So anyway, it's, it's not to put people into, into uh, cubby holes or, or to limit them, but just to say that I, I think this is a very positive influence. Um, and then finally, we want to talk about what's going on here. And yeah, or 121 days and counting. So what's the impact? Well, John Langreth, the head of XS, he, he coined the, store, the, the phrase peak TV in 2015. And he coined the phrase because he thought it was over. A peak, you reach and then you go down. And he thought very shortly after he introduced this concept of peak TV that we would see a contraction in the business. And we didn't. It just kept growing, uh, defying expectation. And as Wall Street uh, has recently said, defying even um, rational, <laughs> rational logic. Um, so here's how TV has grown since 2009. Um, so you know, the show and training program began in 2005, so it was around 210 shows, and we're up at the beginning of the strike to 599 shows. Okay, it's unbelievable, but it's also unsustainable. And uh, that's what Landgraf is saying for a long time. And uh, you know, Wall Street is now beginning to say it too, and so finally these companies are listening, but the 
and a lot more could be said about this, the lemming quality of the way these, these companies have chased each other off the cliff with streaming is truly incredible, and they want us, the writers, to pay the price for their profligacy and their idiocy, um, which we're not gonna do. Um, we'll, we'll pay for it a little bit, but not, but not totally. Anyway, so things were gonna begin to contract anyway, and if you've been following the news, and you know, even, even places like Netflix, they're thinking, yeah, subscribers are one thing, what about profitability? How can you justify this? And, and of course, the other people who haven't even begun to show any profitability are suffering. So it was gonna change, and the strike is gonna change things more. Um, I talked to a few people that I really respect, and uh, one of them said that within a very short period of time, he felt the number of shows would be closer to 300. So whatever it is, it, it, it's gonna, things are gonna look different. And they're gonna look different pretty quickly. Um, just as a snapshot of this, a few companies, it's like the octopus. If you've never read the Frank Norris novel, all of this was predicted in his novel about the, the uh, railroad monopolies um, at an earlier time. But if you look at the companies that control the media, four decades ago, some 50 companies were in charge of most American media. Since 1966, 90% of the media is controlled by six media conglomerates. And the funny thing is, I like this chart, this blue and black chart, because I think it looks like an octopus. <laughs> but it, and it's only a couple years old and it's out of date because it has uh, CBS and Viacom as two separate functions, for example. But these companies are still the ones that dominate. But it's very hard, if you've been, it's very hard to keep track of, what are we calling Paramount now? What, what, you know, what, what, what are we calling Zaslav's company now? What's, I mean, but the fact, all you need to know is that Power is in the hands of fewer people, and in the history of labor and management, that's never been very good for labor. Um, and we're gonna, it's gonna be tough. Uh, I do think, though, with the audience's hunger for the amount of programming they've got, that even if the number of shows is reduced, somehow, in my most optimistic opinion, the number of episodes still has to somewhat compete, which means shows have to make more episodes. If you have fewer shows, but there's still hunger for more content, then you need to make more episodes, which, if you followed my formula, means with volume and pace, you need the showrunner. That's my, my hope. Um, but in any case, it's gonna be tough. But it's always been tough, and so I don't like to end on a negative. Um, we always need stories uh, since time immemorial. And We've always gathered around the campfire and told stories. And we always need people who are tough and visionary and um, in some ways innocent and stupid enough to believe that they can break through. You need that kind of self-belief. Um, and so when we look to the future, you know, it's the people that can light a candle and are so driven that they will continue to tell stories and bring more light to the situation. Um, That'll be the future. So I'm betting on them. And that's it. Oh, thank you. Roseanne, I think I came in a couple minutes over, but. Yeah, the beauty of this is we can play, even though I said we'd start at 11. Well, if there are questions. Yes, ma'am. Let's see some other hands, by the way, as we say in the class. Yes. No, go ahead. So, uh, being a showrunner is hard. It is like being beaten to death with your dream. Um, and it's hard to find that balance. And I <laughs> I, so the question is, how do you, how do you, what advice do you give to showrunners to maintain any kind of even keel or stop from jumping off a building? Um, there are a few things, and, and I'm thinking about the book. There's, there's a section in the book called the 12 Ps, which are the qualities that I think that are important in showrunning. And, and uh, um, the last one is a person. You're a person, and you have to have compassion for that person. Um, and then. The second to last chapter in the book is called Two Suitcases, and it's about work-life balance, and I talk about, about how to do that. It is very tough. 
Um, and my two suitcase analogy is that back before, I'm talking to some of the students today, there was a time before uh, when luggage did not have wheels. And uh, so you, when you're walking through an airport, you had to actually carry your luggage. And if you walked through an airport with one suitcase, you kind of leaned to one side. If you had two heavy suitcases, you would stay upright. The, uh, the key was not letting your knees buckle. As long as you could stay on your feet, actually two suitcases, two suitcases was easier to walk with than one. And to me, the first suitcase is your job, and the other suitcase or however, is, is, is something outside of the job. And you need a counterweight to it. And people find it in different ways. But um, nothing is more important than your emotional and psychological well-being. And uh, anything that threatens that, you have to know and you have to take steps to protect against it. Uh, it, is, it is a real challenge, and like I say, anything that's, any dynamic is never in perfect stasis. You're always going to be, and in our business, where people say, you know, I really kind of lean too far into my family. I kind of enjoyed the job. No, it's always the other way around. Um, but, uh, you know, so depending if you have a partner, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think it was Pauline Kael who said, if you want a friend in Hollywood, get a dog. Um, but uh, you do need something, and I think you need a friend in the business that you can call who understands what's going on. So it's not just because your partner uh, has their own problems and may not want to hear what's going on at work. But if you can call somebody who understands and say, I have a friend that I started on Remington Steel with, and there are times that I will call him and say, um, I know I'm going to get through this. I know all that. I just need to hear you tell me I'm going to get through this. And he said, you're going to get through this. you know, and. Uh, and believe it or not, it's something as silly as that. I mean, it's important. Uh, and then I kind of take a deep breath and, and move on. Um, and Ketchy Carroll tells this story, so I can use her name. She's a wonderful showrunner. And uh, it reminds me a little bit of Temple Grandin. If you haven't seen that movie, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie with Claire Danes. Um, and uh, she had, what was her diagnosis? Is she, is she autistic? autistic? Yeah, and, and so she needed to, to go. She developed a device to calm herself down, which kind of put her in a harness of some sort. It's almost like the old stocks and the public stocks. And then she used that theory to help develop a humane system for dealing with animals. But, um, but, it, but it worked for her. Well, and Ketchy will tell her, if things get overwhelming, she'll tell her assistant, um, give me five minutes. She'll go into her office, she'll close the door, and she literally crawls under her desk. I don't know exactly what she does there. <laughs> but when she comes out, she feels better. It reminds me also of dogs. Dogs like to go into places like that. There's a certain feeling of comfort. And uh, I think it's... What? You put animals in a squeeze. It's like swaddling an infant. Right, so, so the swaddling type of thing. Anyway, whatever works, that works for her. And she is one of the most together, upbeat people I know. And so I thought... First of all, I applauded her courage in telling us that story. Um, and that's great. I know I... I do not believe in self-medication in any serious way, um, but I do keep a bottle of Kentucky's Finest in my bottom drawer, and, <laughs> and there are one or two occasions, and it's usually in the morning, because I know I'm going to have something tough come up. I know I'm going to have a tough notes call or something. And the Italians have something they call Cafe Coretto, which is usually with grappa, but I find that bourbon works fine. And, um, <laughs> and, and all it does is just take the edge off, because I know that I'm vibrating, and I just need to kind of come back to earth. And, uh, but, but, but your question is a good one, and there's no glib answer to it. The hardest part is that you don't have a peer, and it's really lonely, because you have to continue to operate. You're the leader. You want to inspire. But, so it's just lonely. And then you have all, you don't, there's no like, contemporary peer you have that you can trust. Yeah, that's a good point. You're saying it's, it's lonely. It is lonely at the top. And it, it's something that I do talk about in the book, too. And it has to be, because it, you cannot get too close to your writers or your actors or anybody, because you're going to make decisions that they're not going to agree with. And under those pressures, friendships disintegrate, but respect doesn't. So you need to establish respect and maintain that respect. And friends, I'm friends with a number of people I've worked with, not that many, but on shows, but but. I only developed those friendships outside of the, once that show was over, particularly with actors. There are a handful of actors, but, and I love actors, but um, you can't afford to, uh, uh, to, to, to get too close. Um, but that's why having a friend in the business that you can talk to is really important. Um, you know, another piece of advice I have in the book is look up, whatever that means to you. Uh, whether it's religion, whether it's just lobbing a tennis ball up in the air and playing a game of tennis, whatever it is, 
that gives you a sense there's something more important than the third act that you're working on. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and things will return to normal. But it's, I, I don't want to minimize the, uh, the importance of what you're talking about, because if you can't take care of yourself, then you're no good to anybody. And so part of... Oh my God, are you my therapist? What's happening? <laughs> right. Well, but you do need, you know, um, as you can tell, I'm a big believer in therapy because you need to know what your triggers are. You need to know what your hot buttons are so that you can take measures. You want to, what I, what I it, it's, it's not that you can't get angry, for example, in this business, but I like the expression, use your temper, don't lose your temper. So there are times that people deserve to hear you speak rather firmly, but you should be under control. You should be governing just how much of that steam are you letting into the engine. Um, at the point that you're no longer controlling it, you've lost. So... And I also think it's very important, no crying in baseball. You know, you do not want your team to see you at your worst. They believe in you and you've got to keep that up. That doesn't mean you can't be a human being, but there are certain things you just can't let them in on, which is why Nkechi crawls under her desk, you know, uh, because that's what she needs to do. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, first, thank you. That was like peering into the matrix. And it's <laughs> even changed since, and expanded in new information since we got to see it in the MFA program. So. Thank you for that. But I, my question was, with the predicted contraction, do you see a loss in some of the diversity and access and pipeline programs that have brought so many women or people of color or, or LGBTQ plus people to, to make their pipeline that, that fit? So the question is, will contraction disproportionately affect minority programs and other programs that try to address marginally under, you know, historically underrepresented groups? I do think they'll be hit disproportionately. I just think history tells us that. Um, and my friends uh, who come from those groups uh, tell me that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I take that seriously. What can be done, you know, is just to continue to fight it. And I do think that with the numbers that we're talking about, certainly when it comes to the number of women in the business, there's no going back. I mean, you can't shut the door on that. Um, there's just too much influence now and, and too many people. We don't see enough women at the C-suite level at all. And, uh, um, that's the next barrier, I think, to really be cracked. But, um, but even so, uh, I don't want to put too much pressure on any women who get up to that level. The, bit, the jobs are so difficult that I don't know if any one individual can change the tide. But in terms of what, I think you're better off expecting the worst, hoping for the best and, and expecting the worst and knowing you're just going to have to work that much harder. Um, I just think that's what history tells us. Anyone else? Rondo. Can you give us some detail about the children's lab? I mean, how long is it? Uh, it's months, uh, it's every day? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's six weeks, it's six Saturdays from, from 8.30 until um, usually around 4. At 8.30, the doors open, and that's very important. It's bagels and coffee, and then the program begins at 9. Uh, we take like an hour for lunch, and it's, it's, uh, the pedagogy is... Originally, I didn't want to do much top-down instruction at all because our business isn't necessarily dependent on that. It's, it's anecdotal. So you have panels. Uh, we'll have case studies that we'll give people to do. Um, and it's organized. The, 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 the metric is going from writer to manager. That's, and so the first session is all about what does that mean. And, uh, and then the next one is managing writers in the writer's process. Then it's like managing directors, managing actors, managing production. Um, Managing executives uh, and managing yourself is, uh, is part of the last one, and managing your career. And increasingly, uh, that last one, managing yourself and work-life balance, has become more important to people. And I think that's not coincidental with the rise of more women in the program, too. There's more emphasis on that. Um, so that's the, you know, and that, we've talked about should we do more than six weeks. I mean, it seems to get people to give up six Saturdays, um, uh, is a pretty big commitment, and, and we, we have a, a staff and a faculty, I should say. It's a rotating door of people who, I'd say we have 40 or 50 showrunners that we depend on to come in in various combinations during the course of that. And we have executives that come in and actors and directors as well. Um, and, uh, I mean, we have some just t terrific uh, people that, that participate in the program every year. Um, from Bill Lawrence and Sean Ryan, and uh, well, Carol Barbie's done a lot, being a sued. Um, Julie Pleck. I mean, I could go on and on and on and catchy and catchy. Uh, but it's, it's uh, and then we do, in addition to panels and some top-down, 
Uh, we then break into groups and we do very much like a film festival. So if we have four panelists, we'll break the class into four groups and everybody gets 15 minutes with each one of those people and then they rotate so that they can ask more uh, individual and personal questions uh, as they go around. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the, 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 the general layout. And one thing that's interesting also about that is that when we began the program in 2005, the section on managing post-production, managing editing, we made optional because my assumption coming out of the broadcast system is that some people would have spent plenty of time in an editing bay. Um, and so we made it optional that you didn't have to come to that session. Now that's the one that gets probably as much interest as anything else. People come to us and they say, well, I was a co-executive producer on my last two shows and I've never sat in on an edit of a show. I wouldn't know what to do if somebody said, you're in charge of this episode. That's pretty frightening. It's not a reflection on them, it's a reflection on what's happened to the business. And so we spend a lot of time on post-production, uh, which, by the way, is such a kick. I mean, it's like it's, uh, um, I, I love post-production. I think it's, uh, it, it can be exasperating, but I, I feel very much like in Apollo 13 when those guys were stuck up in space and they were running out of air and back down on the ground, the engineers were saying, well, this is what they got in the capsule, and we gotta make this fit into this using only that. And uh, that's the way editing is. Okay, we gotta make that fit into this using only that. We can, you know, that's, that's fun. But I, I like doing crosswords and things like that. So I say the answer is there. You just gotta figure it out. Yes? Why do you think there, why do you think there isn't sort of a job called show running and like a, and a writer's guild? Um, there's a real clear reason why, why there's not a job called show running for the writer's guild. We are a writer's guild, okay? We are a labor union for writers. And as we described here, a showrunner is a manager and a writer. We hire, we fire, that's management. So that's why we have what we are called the 14K provisions in the Writers Guild, which divides out your pay between your responsibilities when you have a writer-producer title between what's strictly writing and what's producing. And we just keep hoping that the IRS will continue to ignore um, <laughs> the implications of that because it is schizophrenic, but that's why. The, that's why there is a producer's guild. And what we talked about, because the, the, the GGA has a wonderful set of guidelines um, uh, about their rights. And people say, how come we don't have that for showrunners? I said, because we don't have showrunner rights. We're not, we don't exist, uh, technically. But, and, but, don't we, but don't we want to? Isn't it in our, wouldn't it be in our Wouldn't it be in our advantage to have, it, it, it's a contradiction in terms, and I don't think the Writers Guild wants to go there. I think the implications from a, strictly from a tax and, 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 uh, and, and labor law perspective would put us in a very difficult position. So to the degree you want to negotiate as a producer, uh, that's up to your individual agent and manager to negotiate when you, when you make your deal. But um, it really is to me the third rail and has been for a long time and I don't think that the Guild wants to touch it or bring any public attention to it. So never ask that question again. No, <laughs> no but it, it, it's a perfectly good question, but that's the answer. All right, I think we've reached the limit. Oh, I know, we can sit here all day. I can sit all day. Mm -hmm. But we have to be fair to all the folks who are meant to go at 11 o'clock. We'll call it 11.15, so everyone has about 25 minutes now. It's going to cost you the last thing to put the text. So 11.15, be in the room, you need to for ABC. And we have to say thank you to Jeff. Mm -hmm. <laughs>